From the corner of Augusta Street and Jones Avenue, in the heart of the Augusta Road neighborhood in Greenville, South Carolina, welcome to the worship of God with the people of Augusta Road Baptist Church, a loving, inclusive Christian community that lives out its faith in Jesus Christ through transformative relationships, engaging worship, radical hospitality, and faithful service. Thank you for joining us for this online worship experience today. And we hope that as you engage in this worship experience with us, that you will feel as though you are part of our community. We consider you a brother and a sister, even if you are not with us. We pray that you are doing well, and that you feel the presence of Christ in this time and in this worship experience. We would invite you to find out more about our church by going to our website or our Facebook page or downloading our church app. We thank you for your continued generosity and partnership with us in ministry, and we would invite you to give to support our ministries as well. In all things, we hope that you will find the presence of Christ with you as you engage in worship. So welcome to the worship of God, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. I will be reading Psalm 106, 1 through 6, 19 through 23, and 47 and 48. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. We have sinned even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. At Horeb they made a calf and worshiped, and worshiped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before them to keep his wrath from destroying them. Save us, Lord our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you at times confused and overwhelmed by the events of our everyday lives. Keeping jobs, finding jobs, are we safe? Are we healthy? What does my child need? How do I pay for it? How can I help a friend in need? Who do I trust? Who do I vote for? And on and on in an ever increasing whirlwind of doubts and fears diverting our attention from you. Some of these can grow into false idols. If I can work a little later, one more Saturday, one more business trip, a little more overtime and I can provide this for my family or take that vacation. While the intention may start as noble, if it does not put you first, it will come crashing down. No matter the reason our focus turns away, help us to know that bringing our doubts and fears and problems to you first is the answer and not the last resort. We pray that you will continue to lead us in our thoughts and deeds, that you mend our bodies and spirits and bring us closer to you. Please help us to act on your will as you choose to reveal it and make us better stewards of the gifts you provide. Amen.
Hello, what's the most important rule in your house? Do you like that rule? Do you know why it's so important? We might not always like having rules to follow, but almost always they are important and they help us out. Today we're going to hear a story again from the book of Exodus. We're hearing more about Moses' story. Remember Moses from last week? He was the baby floating down the river. He spoke to God in a burning bush. He led the Israelites away from slavery in Egypt. Well, here's a bit more of that story. One day when Moses was up on a mountain spending time with God, he took longer than anyone expected him to take, like weeks. And while he was up there, the people started to get restless. These were the same people that he had led out of Egypt. Now Aaron, Moses' older brother, was with them. He'd helped Moses out with some things in the past that God had asked. And he told the people to gather up the gold from jewelry that everybody had. So they went around and they got all of the gold jewelry and gave it to Aaron. So he took that gold and he melted it down and he made a gold baby calf, a cow, out of it. And it might have looked something like this. What if I told you that he made it to be an idol? Now an idol is something that you worship so let me remind you of some of the rules that God gave Moses. There were 10 of them, and they are, do you know the name? The 10 Commandments. One of those rules says not to make idols or anything to represent God. Basically, God is saying, I am bigger than you can imagine, so don't make anything that looks like me you will get it wrong. It's a good rule, and Aaron and the others broke it. Here's the silly part. Can you believe of all of the things that they could make that idol to be, to look like, that they chose a baby cow? Is God like a baby cow? No, that's incredibly silly. I think they knew that though. I think that they were missing Moses, and they weren't sure what to do and really just wanted something that they could see, that they could touch, that they could dance around, that they could live their lives around feeling that God was with them. You see, a God that they couldn't see was just too scary. So they broke one of God's rules. Was God happy? No way. God told Moses on the mountain what was happening and that Moses needed to get down to them quickly. You see, God was really angry with them, but also I think probably very sad about what they had done and had decided to punish them for doing something so incredibly wrong. Moses sat on that mountain and Moses talked to God on behalf of the people that made that wrong choice. And I like this part. God listened to Moses and God changed God's mind. How cool was that? Here's where we learn a bit more about who God is, how God is merciful, slow to anger, how God loves us even when we don't deserve it. We can also see how important it is for us to talk to God, to pray to God like Moses. God gave the Israelites rules, important rules to follow to keep them safe and to help them live. God expected them to follow those rules. God gives us those same exact rules too, to keep us safe, to help us live. And God expects us to follow those rules too. It's our job to do our best to follow these rules and if we ever fail at them, and we will, just like those Israelites, we're not perfect, we're gonna mess up, God forgives us too, and never stops loving us. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for listening to us. Help us to follow your rules. Amen. In the sermon last week, we focused on the portion of God's redemptive story told in the 12th and 13th chapters of Exodus, as Moses and his brother Aaron were preparing to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. The story of the Passover and the liberation from Egypt is a story that has been at the very heart of the Jewish identity from that time until this one. It is a reminder to us all that God is always working for liberation and freedom for us that God hears our cries, that God answers our prayers, and we know that because of the work of God through Christ to offer salvation and liberation to all people, we have a story that we remember and continue to tell. And each time we tell it and act it out, it has the power to embolden our faith and make us more resilient. Well, today, we skip ahead some 20 chapters in the book of Exodus to chapter 32. Moses has led the people to the base of Mount Sinai, and he has gone up to the mountaintop to commune directly with God. It was there, on that mountain, that God gave Moses the Torah, the law, the commandments, the rules that would serve as the foundation of the Israelites' communal life together. And it starts with the idea that the God who led the people out of Egypt, Yahweh, I Am, is the one true God. They will have no other gods before Yahweh. Then beyond that, they will not make any idol of anything on earth or in heaven that could be used to replace the one true God or that even might give them a false image of God who cannot be seen. Moses shares these rules with the people, and they began to establish their ordered life together. He continues to go up to the mountain from time to time to commune directly with God, the first person really to do that since Abraham. And on one occasion, he's up on the mountain really for longer than anyone ever expected. Exodus tells us that he was up there for 40 days. Now, it may have been that he was up there on the mountain for 40 literal days, or 
describing a period as 40 days in length was also an, a way in ancient Hebrew literature of simply saying he's been up there for a really long time. Either way, he was gone for far longer than the Israelite people could stand. The people were waiting at the base of the mountain. Their leader and their direct connection with God, the God who had liberated them, was nowhere to be found. He was gone for so long that many must have assumed that he was dead. At best, he'd gotten lost and in their mind wouldn't return. And without their leader, the people began to get restless. Fear and uncertainty began to take them over. They longed for someone or something that could give them assurance that they were still on the right track and that everything was going to be okay. And this is what happened in Exodus 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On August 28, 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. and gave one of the greatest, most memorable, most profound, and most prophetic speeches in American history. During the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, as it was called, in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King called upon the promises of our nation to be extended to all people who at that time felt as though the government had continued to fail them including and especially people of color. In great oratorical fashion, he painted a picture of a bad check, a promissory note of sorts that had been given to all people, but when people of color had gone to the bank to deposit it, the note had been marked insufficient funds. That isn't the part of the speech that everyone remembers, though, is it? Of course, the part of the speech that everyone remembers is the final section. In reality, Dr. King had been coming to the conclusion of his remarks when all of a sudden, as if it were an urging from someone in the pew on Sunday morning, 
or even an urging from God's own self, the voice of a woman standing close to him on the platform, the voice of a gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson, spoke to Dr. King. She must have heard him speak before, and in some way, she must have sensed that the speech needed a little something extra. It wasn't quite finished. It needed a little more inspiration, a little more flourish at the end. So she spoke directly to the preacher in that moment. Go back and watch the video of the speech. It's brilliant. He's about 11 minutes into his prepared remarks when Miss Jackson calls out to Dr. King and says, Tell him about the dream, Martin. And he takes his cue from her. He takes his eyes off of the paper and speaks directly to the people. And he assures them that there is no need to wallow in the valley of despair. He said, even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. Dr. King went on to describe and inspire with images of a dream of what America can be. A land of justice and equality a land of prosperity for all, a land that improves upon itself with each generation, constantly striving for perfection and for which all people should work. It was a dream that he said was rooted in the American dream, but as a Christian and a pastor, his words were obviously inspired by a far greater dream than one that could be contained within the borders of the United States of America. It was inspired by the dream God has dreamed for the entire world from the beginning. It was a dream toward which God has been working and to which God has been calling all people since the very beginning of time. You see, there is a gap, a space, a great chasm of sorts between the way that the world is on one side and the way God desires it to be on the other. It is right in the middle in the in-between space, in that gap, where God calls all Christ followers to stand. It is into that place that we are invited to partner with God and with Christ to do whatever work is necessary to, in the words of Episcopal Bishop Michael Curry, turn this world from the nightmare it can so often be into the dream God always intended it to be. That is a high and holy calling given to each of us. It is a calling that we actually hear Jesus proclaim in the Gospels when he speaks of God's kingdom at hand and on the move in the world. It is a place where people are able to be in relationship with God and love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love their neighbors just as they love themselves. It is a place where all people are able to have what Christ called abundant life and life to the full. And Christ calls all of his followers to join in the work of making disciples of all nations and bearing witness to all people, showing them the love and redemption of Christ wherever we are and in whatever ways we can to make sure that those around us have lives that are more abundant and free and so that the earth looks more like heaven. But the journey of faith is a lifelong endeavor. It isn't something towards which we can train and work and then finally reach a point where we can retire from it. We must always be growing and forming spiritually because there is always work still to be done. And we long for a day when God finally finishes the story, when the dream is realized, and as it is described in the book of Revelation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And because of the final redemptive work of God, peace reigns on the earth. The dream and the reality finally meet, and we can all rest in God's glory forever. And we're not likely to see that day in our lifetime. And more often than not, life, even for people of faith, can feel like a long trek through the dangerous wilderness, just like it was for the Israelites. It can feel like we are constantly moving, but not getting anywhere. The struggles of the wilderness, struggles to survive, to keep it all together, to stay the course when it seems like hope is lost, can threaten to get the better of us. We can lose focus. We may have moments of deep faith when our entire lives are centered in our relationship with God, but there are other times when something gets in the way. Something can take the place of our relationship with God, or we can think we are following God closely but our understanding of God is actually somehow off base. And we lose sight of the dream. 
or we focus on our dream instead of God's dream, and we need to be brought back on track. We need a focused and a resilient faith. Just look at the story of the Israelites. In the grand scheme of things, it hasn't been any time at all since God has led the people out of slavery in Egypt and given them instructions for setting up their life together. God had showed up in plagues, in the parting of the sea, and in defeating the greatest army ever known at the time. But as they sit and wait for Moses to return from his spiritual retreat on Mount Sinai, they get restless and they forget their story. They forget God's work for them. They forget that they are called to be part of God's dream for the world, to show the world how life was meant to be with God. God had not only saved the Israelites and brought them out of slavery, but God had also made a covenant with them through the giving of the law, the commandments. But as they wait, and as they get restless, they forget their arrangement with God too. Out of worry and fear, they look at Aaron and ask him to make for them something they can see, something tangible, something they can touch, an image of a God that they can worship and follow since they had no clue as to when Moses would return. And they weren't certain that they could count on God to come through on God's promises either. The people go to Aaron and say, make for us Elohim in Hebrew. Most of our English translations translate the word Elohim to read the little g, God's plural. And that is how we have historically interpreted this passage. In a moment of fear, the people ask the second person in command among them, Aaron, who is serving in the top spot while his brother Moses is away, to help them violate the first and second commandments. They don't know if God is still with them because Moses is not with them. If Moses isn't with them, can they still trust God to be faithful? If not, they feel like they need to move in a different direction. They feel like they need a different God, one that they are going to put before them instead of the one true God. They want a God that they can see and touch. They want what we call an idol. An idol in biblical terms is a false God. It's a fake. It's a poor substitute. It isn't real. Idols are what everyone else worships and follows, while Israel worships and follows the one true God. Idols are something that draws you off course and takes your focus off of God and puts it somewhere else. For the Israelites, it was something that made them like everyone else because it made their worship exactly like everyone else's instead of making them an example for all of the world to see. Sometimes an idol isn't something that we choose to pursue, is something that we choose to pursue instead of God. It is something that gets in the way of our relationship with God. The pursuits of our lives, when seen through the lens of our relationship with God, can be good and healthy expressions of our faith and our journey through this life. But if we aren't careful, they can become the thing we desire most. Success, advancement, accumulation of wealth and possessions, comfort, popularity, personal gratification and pleasure, these things are sometimes the byproduct and the result of hard work and living well, but sometimes they can be the thing we strive for most. Sometimes our idol can be our relationship with other people besides God. God desires for us to have companionship and love. God desires for us to know the pleasures of intimacy and family. God desires for us to have friends and communities of support and care. But those relationships and the satisfaction and joy we get out of them meant to be defined and shaped by our relationship with God. The way we enter into and maintain those relationships should be governed by our relationship with God. But if we pursue companionship and intimacy and family and camaraderie without first knowing that our life is defined by the love God has for us, we can end up putting even those relationships first and lose our focus. Sometimes our idol is what other people think of us or stories that other people would tell of us about who we are that we allow to define us instead of what God thinks about us and what God would say of us. It seems at least at first that even Aaron gave in to that idol. The people crowd around him. They grumble, complain, criticize. 
And perhaps his motive didn't start out impure. Maybe he wanted the people to feel reassured and happy. But instead of giving them what they needed, sure and steady leadership, a non-anxious presence in the midst of crisis, pointing them back to their calling and the journey they were walking with God, he gives them what they want so that they'll be appeased. They ask for the image of God, of a God, and he gives it to them. How often and in how many different ways do we put someone else's expectations of us or what someone else thinks of us ahead of what God expects from us or thinks of us? Living into someone else's expectation can become one of the sneakiest idols there is. We might not even see it coming until it is too late. We've put it before God until we've been drawn completely off course. Instead of focusing on ways that we can express our relationship with God or draw closer to God, we have done everything we can to simply please those around us, make them happy. Really make them happy with us. Placing too much or all of our value on what someone else thinks of us or doing everything we can to please someone else's expectations instead of God's is the mark of the truly spiritually insecure. A deeply devoted relationship with God can free us from that idol because we find our truest identity in a relationship with God. That is what defines us, and we make it our life's work to please God regardless of what other people think. Now, Jesus himself said we can't serve two masters. We can only serve one because we will end up loving one and hating the other. And it is often the case that if we try to pursue and follow both God and the things of our own ambition or the relationships for which we long or the approval of others or anything else, if we don't put the pursuit of God first, we will come to resent God when God's desires and expectations for us get in the way of the things we desire for ourselves. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we pursuing? And whether or not those pursuits are seen through the lens of our relationship with God, or if they threaten to stand in the way of our relationship with God. There is also another interpretive lens for this text. Maybe less known to us, but it certainly has something to teach us today. As we already said, the Hebrew word Elohim can be translated in the plural to mean little g gods or idols, but it can also simply mean God, the Lord. Elohim is a Hebrew word used to refer to God at different points all throughout the Old Testament. So when the Israelites ask Aaron to make for them Elohim, they could have also been saying, make for us God. They could have been asking Aaron not to make them an idol of some other false god, but instead to make for them a physical image of the God, the God who did miraculous work to bring them out of Egypt. But they can't see that God, and they desperately want to see that God. If they can see God, then maybe God will always be with them. If they could just see God, then maybe God would always be faithful to God's promises. But the letter to the Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Still, they wanted something that represented God for them. So when Aaron made them a golden calf, maybe it was a familiar image for them based on other gods in the region, but maybe it was meant to represent their God. Or maybe like the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's throne for them, it was meant to be something on which God could ride. Either way, God was not pleased. It fell short. It broke the second commandment by trying to make an image of God that cannot be seen and is not meant to be seen in God's sovereignty. It was a way of trying to contain a God that cannot be contained. Or as Old Testament scholar Rolf Jacobson says it, Aaron was either trying to make an image of a false God or he was trying to give them a false image of the one true God. And I think this interpretation bears a great deal of weight for us today, and it cannot go overlooked. Sometimes our issue isn't that we worship or follow an idol instead of God. Sometimes it's that we have a tarnished image of God that ends up bearing little to no resemblance of the one true God. We end up making God into our image instead of the other way around. We try to make God fit our assumptions about the world 
instead of opening ourselves up to being formed by the divine image that is beyond our capacity to fully comprehend. It's how we end up with prosperity gospel preachers who gather a big audience by telling them that God wants them to be rich instead of showing them Jesus. We talked about the poor being lift up and how difficult it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's how we end up with people proclaiming that if you are a true Christian, they say, then you must vote for this candidate or that candidate or be a party of this or part of this party or the other. Instead of reminding us all that while the gospel is always political, it is never partisan because Christ said that the kingdom of God is not of this world. And it's how we end up with people who think that God hates the same people that they do or that somehow you can follow Jesus and at the same time follow those who believe that God created some human beings better than others simply because of the color of their skin. These and so many other false images of the one true God. They profane the name of God and take it in vain. And yet, because that God looks like us or thinks like us, it's easy for us to understand, we want to follow that God. But we are only being thrown off course. And it drives the one true God crazy. There's a wonderfully profound song that was written and recorded by the duo Johnny Swim and the group Duke, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. It was written in 2018 in response to the rise of open racism and the presence of white supremacists in our society. And it serves as a call to action for all people, including and especially people of faith, to speak up and to not be silent and complicit in the hatred by returning to the images of Jesus. The song says, Ring the bells, this time I mean it. Bid the hatred fare thee well. Give back the pieces of my Jesus. Take your counterfeit to hell. Bang the drums, this means war, but not the kind you're waiting for. We say mercy won't be rationed here. That's what we're fighting for. Move your feet, you tiny people. You've been hiding for so long. Behind your statues and your steeple, does that hit too close to home? Oh, I got faith to move a mountain and to watch that mountain move. It's time for words to fall like thunder, sound of justice breaking through. You call me boy instead of son, and I ain't the only one who was in the throne room of a kingdom where I found that I belong. I ain't scared to face a fortress. I have seen them fall before. With broken bones, you've built it, but it crumbles board by board. Ring the bells this time I mean it. Bid the hatred fare thee well. Give back the pieces of my Jesus. Take your counterfeit to hell. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. God recognizes what is happening with Aaron and the Israelites. They have given themselves over to something counterfeit. And God tells Moses that they've gone too far. God is beyond disappointed. God is so angry that God is ready to wipe them out. God is considering starting over with Moses. He'll make Ab uh, Moses the new Abraham. The covenant, the descendants, the promises, they'll all be his. But Moses says no. Moses is committed to where this journey is leading. He stays the course. He knows the people have lost focus and gotten off course themselves, but God doesn't want, or Moses doesn't want God to get off course too. So he pleads with God to remember the promises that God made. And God thankfully forgives. Getting distracted, forgetting our calling to be forming in, in the faith and to stand in the gap with God and make the reality of the world and the dream God has for it meet or getting drawn off course is all natural. But thankfully, God is willing to forgive. God constantly remains faithful and gives us a chance to try again. If we're going to stay the course, we must remember the purpose and calling that God gives to all people of faith. We must begin to understand our lives and our identities as being a response to God and a response to the needs of the world around us. It's something that God has placed on our hearts, helping us to make meaning from all of the difficulties and hardships and sufferings we experience. It puts God first and foremost in our lives and destroys any false notions of the one true God. And with that purpose in mind, we can live confidently in the gap between the way the world is and the dream God has for it. 
and we can faithfully join in God's work, knowing God is always faithful to us. Peace.